It's time for AgriChat, the official podcast of the Tales of the Agronaut blog and stalwart gaming community, where we talk about stuff and things, and the stuff about the things, and sometimes gaming. I'm Belgast, and let's start the show. Hey folks, it's that time again. Time for another episode of AgriChat. This is episode 221. Tonight I'm joined by Ashgar. Hello. Grace. Good evening. Kodra. Hi. Tam. Hello. And Thalen. Hey there. So tonight is another one of those shows where we've got a bunch of topics that have rolled over from previous episodes. But to get us started, another game about rolling. Great. Tell us about zombie rolling. Uh, so uh, this is something that Ash mentioned that he saw at PAX. And um, I went to take a look at it because it's not technically released yet. Um, but it turns out that it is in early access on Android. So I downloaded it, and I think it might be a reasonable substitute for Justice Monsters 5. It's not as good, it's not exactly the same, and it doesn't have the fun uh, bit of having familiar Final Fantasy monsters to mess around with, but uh, otherwise it's, it's pretty similar, and it's satisfying. Get weird little pinball friends with various pinball magical abilities and you use your pinballs to knock the crap out of some zombies <laughs> it's a good time i don't know why i like pinball games so much but i do and this one is pretty fun so how like you said it was fairly comparable like how detailed is it like is there the whole rpg aspect to it as well or, or pseudo bit. rpg yeah, I mean, there is, you know, this sort of minor little story. You ha your, your pinballs are not actual characters, but you have characters that basically control the pinballs, if that makes sense. Um, and there's a minor little RPG story, and you do level up your guys, and they find various random abilities from a loot box mechanic. Um which, you know, that's annoying, but it doesn't seem like, I don't know, it's not too onerous. It, without dumping money into it, I have felt like I've been able to play reasonably. Yeah, I think that's probably like the, the, the benchmark there is, can you have fun without buying loot boxes? And if yeah, yes, yeah. then it's probably a reasonable game. And it's pretty reasonable to, like, buy loot boxes with, like, currency that you can get from playing the game and i think that's so far the difference from justice monsters 5 is that like yes there is a store and there is currency and things you can buy there and everything seems way less stupidly expensive than it was in justice monsters 5 so you know if i keep playing it i'll probably throw five bucks at them for a one month subscription thing for some extra bonus stuff but um but even without doing that like i feel like i can get reasonable amounts of upgrades and things so far i'm sure usually games like this have some kind of curve uh where it starts feeling like you need more of the cash shop stuff but i certainly haven't hit it yet and i've been playing it every night for the last week that sounds great and you said it was in uh, early access on the Android. Is it like just on the store? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Ash mentioned it, and I went and just looked at the store, and it was just there. I didn't have to do anything special to get it. I will have to check it out. I didn't like uh, Justice Monsters Five as much as you did, but I found it enjoyable nonetheless. And honestly, like I. I think that in a lot of ways you have a bit more control in this game, so depending on what you did or didn't like about Justice Monsters 5, you might like this better, but regardless, I, I've been having fun with it. Smacking zombies in the face with pinballs is satisfying. So another game that uh, has kind of rolled around a bit is uh, Dragon Quest Eleven. Couldn't have rolled around that much, it just came out, but... What, a week ago? Well, I think it's gotten bumped twice, so... A couple of weeks. Yeah, it's been out for two and a half weeks, three weeks. Two and a half Something weeks. like that. Just, it's, it's been out just a few days longer than Spider-Man, which is why I'm playing Dragon Quest XI instead of Spider-Man. <laughs> it, it was on our list the first week it was eligible to be on our list. Yes. 
but yeah, for the first time in almost a decade, we have a new mainline Dragon Quest game, and it's it's a Dragon Quest game. I mean, <laughs> one of the things you can say about Dragon Quest is like they have a core concept and they stick to it. You know, okay, it's... this is very interesting because if there is a blind spot I have in my gaming repertoire, it's Dragon Quest. I mean, I feel like I also have this blind spot to a point because I've not played a Dragon Quest game since we started calling them Dragon Quest in the North American market. Like right. the last one I played was Dragon Warrior 4 on the Nintendo. Which was the last one that we got until Dragon Quest 7 because they skipped 5 and 6. But we got 7 as Warrior 7. We didn't get we Quest did. until 8. Yeah, that's when they switched the names. But we at least got 7 like shortly after it came out in Japan, as opposed to 4 and 5, which they just skipped over, and we eventually finally got them much, much later. But yeah, and it's interesting, because, I mean, Dragon Quest predated... A, it predated Final Fantasy, and B, where we only got one Final Fantasy game for the 8-bit in, you know, Nintendo, we got four Dragon Quests, or Dragon thought, Warrior games. I thought Dragon Warrior 4 was a Super Nintendo game. No, it was, 5 it was, was on the first the Super Nintendo, Nintendo game, and that ah. was the point where they stopped bringing them over. Interesting. Yeah. So, and I, and I don't know if that's part of why I like Dragon Quest so much, is because I played all, all the Dragon Warrior games that we got for the Nintendo Entertainment System, and I loved, um, you know, the first one was pretty straightforward, running around with one character, killing monsters, gathering gold to get better equipment, and finally go beat the Dragon Lord. And, but they, you know, they started getting more complicated after that. You started having Dragon Quest Two. you actually had a party. Dragon Quest Three had the whole thing where you, like, recruited different jobs, into your party and there were that was the first one i played because it came out with a game boy color yeah but then like you know there were things like you you know quests where you had to go recruit a particular job like the one i remember is a merchant and bring them to a place and then when you came back later having brought the merchant to this town caused it to grow and change and stuff which was neat interesting so like what is the big like I always saw them as more generic Final Fantasy, but I never played them. So I don't actually know what sort of is their differentiating factor. I mean, more generic Final Fantasy isn't that wrong. Um, I mean, so, Dragon so... Quest predates Final Fantasy, if I yes. have my... So, like, Final Fantasy... Oh, like, like a year, year. yeah. A year or two. Yeah, two. Final Fantasy is... Because Dragon like... Quest had been out for a while when I got my... Nintendo and Final Fantasy was not yet out at that point. I got Dragon Warrior as a free game pack in for subscribing to Nintendo Power. <laughs> and it was shortly <laughs> after Nintendo Power had started up. Um I yeah. think I, I I think they did that around episode 1 or 2 and yeah, the first couple issues. Yeah, so like I got my copy of Dragon Warrior as a mm -hmm. freebie. <laughs> um, and I loved it. Like I thought it was super good. But then again, I like at that point I hadn't played a lot of. Like I think I'd played Ultima or the Ultima port for yeah, the Ultima um, three, yeah for Nintendo. And mm -hmm. I loved I had it. that too. It was super great. Um, and then Dragon Warrior felt weird because it was a single character game. Like mm -hmm. unlike the party based games I was used to, because um, I played some of the Gold Box games. So like Ultima made sense to me. Um, but like Dragon Warrior was weird. Like it's 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 a single character, kind of like a Zelda game, but like it's a role playing game. So yeah. well, and that first one is the only one where it's a single character. It's a party from two on. But yeah, it was in in a way it was it was a, it was a very similar game to Ultima Three, um, but a little more straightforward. I think like Ultima Three was a little less user friendly, but no. it's that's saying something. <laughs> I mean, I never thought that Dragon Warrior was that complicated, but you know, I mean, these were this this was the '80s, and you know, games were harder back then. <laughs> the thing that was weird in part about because they Dragon, didn't tell you what to do. The thing that was weird about Dragon Warrior, I remember there's a town you can go to early on where they're selling two kinds of armor and two kinds of weapons, mm -hmm. and one of which is like three or four levels higher than the base level that that town has and yeah. i remember like if you just grind your face off you can end up with like way better gear than you could ever have at that level oh yeah there are a yeah. few games i can think of that do that our ocean 3 is the most notable one but yeah Honestly, basically like, fact had something like that going on too 
I think you're right. That's a game I haven't played in forever. It was a good game. It was a great game. But I anyway, don't remember much about it, but yeah. Yeah. It apparently was part of a like much larger series. Um, but anyway, the, basically Dragon Quest thing is... So Final Fantasy is the more... Is the game that tries to be more serious and like epic, I think. Like Final Fantasy is the game where you have villains like Sephiroth who get, you know, choruses singing their praises as they like grow wings and things. Dragon Quest is the game where you're fighting slimes and blobs and, you know, rock golems that are like brick dudes, all designed by Akira Toriyama, the guy that, you know, did Dragon Ball. Um, so also if you play Chrono Trigger, you know, same art style. Also eventually puns, puns everywhere. So many puns, yes. Uh, one of the things that, and I didn't I didn't realize until I'd been playing Dragon Quest XI for a while, it's got full voice in English. It actually does not have any voice in Japanese. Whoa, what? And the reason for that is because so much of the humor only works in written form in Japanese. Because it's based on, like, multiple Alternate readings, readings of, of... Yeah, of, of, of kanji and stuff, and kana. Um, so, and of course, you know, and of course all that humor had to be localized and redone for, you know, for English. Which sure, they, so, but, so we got it in puns. Yeah, and so it's puns. But, and, and yes, so, so many puns. Um, they did a really good job with the localization. I mean, it's, it's, I, I feel like it is an improvement over the previous ones. Um, and the voice acting's really good. But it's, like, I mean, it's, it's a fairly typical, like, fantasy RPG story. You are the, you are apparently the chosen one. You discover this and set out on adventure. Um, you're told to, you know, go talk to the king of the nearest nation because, you know, he'll help you and all this stuff. And one thing leads to another, and you meet some people and join up with them and determine that you need to go find this MacGuffin and start hunting the MacGuffin and gather more party members as you're hunting it. And then when you finally find it, it leads you to, to understand that you have to go find six magical widgets that will let you do a thing and that's the point that i'm at now is i'm hunting down the six magical who's it's but it's it's very it's very cartoony and fun and just you know and i keep discovering more and more things that you can do in it because you know there's there's the base like running around fighting monsters and pursuing the storyline there is a crafting system where you find ingredients and you can throw them into the fun-sized forge and play a little mini game to craft equipment and equipment that you can buy that you buy and find will never have pluses on it crafted equipment can have anywhere from plus one to plus three which makes it more powerful you can reforge equipment that you have to try to increase the plus on it um i've found a casino in a town that has slot machines and a really fancy like slime quest slot where as you're playing it you're like directing this slime in an adventure where it fights monsters and things and mm -hmm. of course by gambling you get tokens that you can trade in for useful equipment and some gear crafting recipes and things like that so is the so like it's a goofy story which can be okay with mm -hmm. me is it what's the combat like what's the What's the it's, battle system like? It's basically active time battle. Wait, it's, what? it's it's turn based. Well, it's not yeah, it's it's basically active time. Like classic. Like, you know, you have your four members of your party and there are the monsters and You guys line up on one side things. and the monsters line up on the other side and you do stuff to, in a turn based fashion. Yes. Or people act according to their speed. Yes. And you have attacks can either hit a single creature or a group of of all of the same type of creature or all the creatures. But yeah, so pretty standard, like classic RPG gameplay. Dra Dragon Quest is a game series that like found a way to do things and has mostly stuck with it over the years. Also, they are much less into RPG re cliche that is not from Final Fantasy is from Dragon Quest. Yes. Yes, Dra Dragon Quest is much less into reinventing itself than Final Fantasy is. Yeah, it's it's sort of and it's part of I, in a lot of ways, it's kind of the reason why Final Fantasy can get away with such radical changes to how it does all of its stuff in, like, game by game, is because Dragon Quest is the other side of that. Yeah. Well, and historically, Dragon Quest was, of the two, was the one that did really, really well in Japan. 
Like Dragon Quest is huge in Japan. Uh, when Isn't Dragon came Quest out, the reason why they don't release during the week? Uh, yes. Yeah. Like when the third one came out, there were like lines and fights over copies, and like it was crazy. Apparently. <laughs> what platform are you playing on? PS4. Because I'm kind of curious how it plays on the Switch. Honestly, nobody knows yet. <laughs> is it not out on the Switch yet? It is not. To to be announced. Oh, okay. We don't even have a date yet. It is yes. currently out on PlayStation 4 and PC. And for everything I've seen, the PC port is excellent. So. Yeah, I feel like of those platforms, I would probably play it on PC. Mostly because Parsec is a thing, and I can play Parsec off of my new Chromebook, which <laughs> is just nonsense to me. <laughs> but yeah, if you like, if you've if you've seen the the plethora of slime creatures that tend to show up in like any Japanese media where it's like a fantasy setting, like this is where they come from. And metal slimes are the worst. No, metal slimes are the best. No, they're amazing. If you can actually defeat them, you get all the XP. It is great. <laughs> yeah, but usually it's hell to hit one of them. There are actually special attacks that you can learn in this game that always hit and deal damage to metal monsters. <laughs> I may have made a point of picking them up. Yeah, there's that too. There's so character advancement. There's like you your character's level as they gain XP. Um, and it's got a skill board, basically, where you gain skill points, and there's a board with, like, different sections of it for, uh, usually it's a couple of different weapon types, like, whichever weapon types that character can use, and then a section specific, one or two ser sections specific to that character. Like, the main character can use swords, great swords, and then it has a basically chosen one section. <laughs> The first dude that joins your party, who is a thief type, has a thief section, sword, dagger, and boomerang. Boomerang is great because it can hit every monster on the board. But, like, its chance to hit drops with each successive monster. Um, but so you can spend the skill points to learn things off the skill board, and you can spend some gold. Once you've gotten past a certain point, you gain the ability to spend gold to reset a section of the skill board and get the points back from it if you want to respend them. Um, and then there are Chrono Trigger style combo abilities that you can basically once a once a character has learned a particular ability and another character learns a particular ability, they gain they can learn one that like the two of them do together. That Character becomes, progression seems to be the one of place where Dragon Quest is experiment. Yeah, somewhat. at least has yeah it makes does some advancement and and changes. It's true. Like they always stick with the you know the standard you level to gain health and attack power and stuff but but yeah but beyond that some games have had a job system some games have had weird things where you could like cross train your party members to learn their abilities or mm -hmm. yeah because three had you couldn't actually change jobs like in the middle of leveling but once a character hit i, I want to say level 20 in 20. A particular suppression they could switch to another one and i repeated this exactly yeah and so they would retain abilities from the previous one and then have to start leveling back from one on the new one, but then, you know, I mean, it's basically like D&D. They also keep out their stats. The yeah. So they're a lot stronger than a level one character would be. And do you do this to level, like, ultimately build a super character? You can. It's kind of unnecessary in 3. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> but it's absolutely... Dragon Quest has always been a game where you can grind if you want to. And you can grind far, far more than is necessary to, to beat the game. Like, back in the early days, some grinding was necessary just to be able to keep up with where you needed to be. Um, really nowadays, be. you really don't need to grind to keep up with, like, where your level should be. But it, it can be helpful to gain additional gold to, to pick up equipment. And sometimes there'll be side quests that want you to do a particular thing, and that'll require some grinding just to find the monster that you want to kill or get your characters in a state where they can use the particular pet power that the quest wants you to use. Which those are the combo abilities. It's pet powers. Yeah, you know, talking about Dragon Quest, the classic RPG that I would love to see another one of, but we will never ever get one, Fantasy Star. We just got one two years ago, last year. I kind of thought so, yeah. Really? Like Early. a mainline Fantasy Star game? Or, sorry, I'm confusing that with Star Ocean. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, Star Ocean, totally different thing. Um, 
Not Fantasy Star Online, but like mm-hmm. actual Fantasy Star. I mean, we got Fantasy Star Nova. I don't know how that hmm. relates to regular Fantasy Star. Apparently, it has a strong storyline and emphasizes the single player mode. So, potentially. But that was 2014. Yes. It's still been a while. A little while. That said, it's been almost a decade since we got a Dragon Quest game. Over <laughs> here. Yeah. I I remember like Fantasy Star releasing a bunch of not amazing uh co- or like mobile only games or like handheld i mean yeah they were like some portable games yeah. yeah i just remember four being phenomenal and two being phenomenal and three not really being worth mentioning so another game that has gotten some play that we haven't actually talked about i don't think is hyperlight drifter i got into this one because it's on the switch and i like playing games on the switch it turns out for some reason, I like mentally put uh, this game and Hollow Knight in a similar place. Because of their storytelling? I don't know. I don't know what it is. It feels like it might be because of their storytelling. <laughs> I mean, they feel like very similar games to me. They're they're uh, 2D, difficult but, um, difficult but consistently so. Like, difficult in a learning to play this is the hard part. Um, doing, you know, they're doing a particular, they, they have, like, particular art styles. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. Mentally, mentally, they fill a similar place for me. Um, but I like Hyperlight Drifter. I actually found out I like Hyperlight Drifter more, even though its storytelling is not as good as Hollow Knight's. Um, they're both doing the, like, oh, we're going to visually, we're going to use just straight visual storytelling. And you and like have these somebody took uh, a picture is worth a thousand words way too literally. Hyperlight Drifter has no text. Yeah, yes, which hyper, is different from Hollow Knight. Hyperlight, yes, Hyperlight Drifter has no text, and straight up, I think that it should. Like that is a game that that is a game that is trying to tell a more complicated story than I feel like it's able to without using any text whatsoever. As I've um, never gotten that far in the game, I can't really speak to that very much. I mean, I feel like I don't quite understand what happened despite having beat the game. Right. Yeah, it's entirely possible to not understand what happened despite having beaten the game. Or, and like, not even, it's not, e- for me, it's not even really, it's not even just, oh, uh, you know, we, oh, there's interpretations. It's, I don't have a full sense of what, was even happening like i did a bunch of stuff but i don't know what any of it meant if anything just because the the game isn't super clear about it um but that having been said the the gameplay is great uh it's got a ton of it's got a ton and like most of mostly what it is is you are you are wandering around this fairly big broken world trying to find, you know, trying to find these shards so that you can unlock things and beat bosses, ultimately working your way towards unlocking this big thing in the center of the map. Very, like, classic style. So is it a Metroidvania, or...? No. It's not, because you can go pretty much anywhere at any time. Yeah, like, you can go in any direction, and I think... I think there are some wrong choices. There are some wrong choices. But, like, there's... I don't think I ran into... There are places that, like, you wouldn't be able to make it through or survive without upgrades. But it doesn't really matter which upgrades you're using, if that makes sense. You just need some upgrades. Because, like, a lot of places are like, oh, you need chain... you, You need chain dash for this. Or more health potions. I'm actually curious which, uh you think is the right pathway um it depends on for me for me i think that there's there's three i feel like i feel like there's three right answers depending on which way you want to play if you like to grind before fighting a boss the right answer is go north get a bunch of upgrades then go east to actually fight a boss um if you like jumping into the deep end of the pool go north and just do north and fight the boss and if you uh, if you don't like those things, go east. Like I think just going east is the easiest uh, easiest route because that's the that's probably the easiest boss. 
Yeah, I would say going east is probably the easiest boss. I went north and did have quite a bit of challenge on the boss, and then I went east and one-shot the boss without even thinking about it. Yeah, and I had like I had a similar experience with west, where by the time I got to the west boss, I had enough upgrades and I was familiar enough with the game that the west boss took me only a couple of tries. Like, as soon as I had, basically, uh, every boss has a different... They have, like, predictable attack patterns, but you have to understand what they're doing. Uh, and the West boss will will just kill you outright in the first five seconds until you realize what is going on. And you're like, oh, okay. And then as soon as I realized that, it was not actually that hard. but Or not, not as hard as... It didn't take me as many tries. But there is that, that wake-up call, like, oh, he just jumped at me and I died. Oh, okay. But, like, death is not a much of a setback, mostly. Spawn at the checkpoint. Your checkpoint is probably pretty close. Yeah, your checkpoint... There are a few places where I felt like there should have been a checkpoint, and there wasn't. But for the most part, like, oh, I died, I checkpoint, like, often less than 30 seconds away. Which I like, because it, it gives me the opportunity to like try crazy stuff and it's it's um difficult but forgiving if that makes sense like yeah you're gonna mess up and die doing a var a variety of things but there's not going to be a sense of loss or a sense of setback to doing it it's like dying trying silly things in wow like oh, all right well you're gonna lose a bit of time and incur some repair bills but you might also try something you also you might also find something really interesting versus like dying in dark souls where whoops, I died, and I have this debt that I now have to pay off because I, you know, died. I have to go find my body and get all these souls back, and I probably lost some of those souls if I can't make it back in time, et cetera, et cetera. It does have um, a thing where, especially on the harder bosses, uh, both Hollow Knight and Hyperlight Drifter have that thing where you can sort of learn... The bosses have various patterns. You learn the patterns, you learn the tells, you get better, and you get to, like, eventually succeed. Yes. It's like, oh, this is the mechanic. This is the new mechanic. And I think that part of the reason that the the North boss is the hardest is because it has multiple phases. It has, like, four phases, whereas the other bosses, the other two bosses do not. And then the south is sort of just a area full of bosses for you to fight. Yeah, you have to unlock... Yeah, you go north, north, east, and west. And then south is... Uh, south is only unlocked when you get to... When you unlock... When you've beaten bosses in the other three. And that's a... It's less geography and more a boss rush. Um, which I found a lot of fun. Because at that point, I kind of... I felt like it was well-timed. Because I felt because at that point I had gotten really used to like the things that were the most interesting for me in the game at that point were the bosses, and so South was a lot of fun because it was like oh okay it's not it's showing me some new enemy types but I've kind of seen a wide variety of enemy types at this point and like I know how to handle various room setups that they try to do and so then you go into it's like oh okay you're just gonna run through a bunch of bosses but I found the bosses really fun. I found all of the bosses fun, except in South, the one that had the the spinning weapon. I found him to be a little frustrating. And then I found oh, the, the scythe guy. Yeah, the scythe guy. Oh. But then I, I found the last boss both very difficult but very fun. Yes. Uh, same same deal. They they the last boss is also a bullet hell shooter, and so that was exciting to discover. So I had seen footage of this that looked like a bullet hell shooter, so I'm wondering if that was the encounter I had seen. Possibly. Like, there's as there's parts of it where it's like, here's a bunch of stuff that you need to dodge. But there wasn't like, hey, I'm going to flood the board with like a hundred things to for you to try to avoid or reflect or whatever. Until that last boss. Until that last boss. Um, I did really enjoy, I enjoyed the the upgrades. I feel like I've talked about games that I've I've probably gone on rants about like games that don't show you what the right upgrades are. Like there's right answers for the upgrades, and they don't show you what the right ones are in an intuitive way. Um, I strongly feel like the 
they show you three upgrades in top, middle, bottom, and I feel like the right order of upgrades are top, top upgrades, then middle upgrades, then bottom upgrades in all cases. Top dash upgrade is the chain dash, and the second dash upgrade is the reflect projectiles, right? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds right. And, and in the sword case, it's the same deal. There's the charge attack, and then there's bullet reflect attack. Um, I went through the entire... I, I, I actually beat the entire game without ever needing... Without ever buying the two types of dash attacks. Um, and I picked them up, and I didn't really I didn't really like them. I think they're too costly stamina-wise to use. Um, but also, I use most of my stamina chain dashing. I played the entire game without any uh, bullet reflect... Which made that last fight even funnier. Uh, I It was very much me having to find patterns where I knew when I could weave in and out of the bullets. And then the last one, like, I ultimately beat it with a one health remaining. It felt really good. Yeah, the, it, the game is really good at setting up, uh, setting up difficult, setting up difficult situations and, like, making you want to experiment with new strategy. Like, Forcing you to experiment with new strategies, but not punishing you too hard when those strategies don't pan out, which I think might be why I why I ended up liking it a little bit more than Hollow Knight is because if I tried a new strategy and it didn't work out and I died, I now have a lengthy run back and setback to that failed experiment. Whereas trying a strategy and failing was like, whoops, I lost 30 seconds. Uh, but it is like, it can be frustratingly difficult in places uh especially that first boss like i feel like it would be really easy for somebody to to pick up the game play go north fight that bird wizard boss beat it or not and be like this game is harder than i want to play and quit um and i would i would not blame them in any way except that i found that in most cases the rest of the game was not that difficult it's actually funny what happened to me the first time i played was i got completely lost because the north lays out a very set expectation for how you're supposed to find these shards they're all at the end of a long dungeon and then i just kept i never found the fourth long dungeon and realized that oh actually the the fourth shard in or the third shard in uh the frog area is hidden I like you say the fourth shard, like there's four shards. I know. There's eight (laughs) shards, and five of them were hidden. And the game does not necessarily let you know how stuff is hidden, I feel like. Like, Like, now that I know it, I have actually been a lot better at finding hidden stuff, because I know to look for, like, the tiny little tells. But if you haven't seen those yet, then you're going to miss a lot. So during this conversation, you've referenced Hollow Knight quite a bit, and I know that's seen a lot of recent play. But uh, what what were you saying, Grace, just a moment ago? Oh, well, this actually pertains to both Hollow Knight and Hyperlight Drift, or just a general comment, which is, I miss games having difficulty levels. Like, there are games that I... Hyperlight Drifter has difficulty levels. I mean... Admittedly, their their version of easy is not easy. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess, like, especially in relation to Hollow Knight, like, yeah. there's there's things I want to see. Like, the game is legitimately really fun, and also, I just cannot play it at the level it's expecting me to. I just yeah. can't. And when I try, I just get really frustrated. I mean, I, I got to the first, last boss, my first playthrough, and then I gave up, because... I couldn't kill it, and I couldn't do what I needed to do to get my nail upgraded, and it made me really upset, actually. Like, because the game is gorgeous, and it's fun, and it has a cool story, and I really want to play it and experience it, and my choices are watch it on YouTube or just not, and it kind of sucks. Yeah. I mean, I don't... Yeah, I, I totally agree. I feel like at the point at which you can opt into harder difficulty levels like don't like there's no reason your 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 game is not better by having a you must be this tall to ride sign in front of it yeah i mean i guess you know there's this perception in gaming that like well you just need to get good like no screw it like if you're trying to tell a story here then let me see the story yeah 
And and I guess Hollow Knight, you know, I think it bothered me more in some ways because I tried a second playthrough and in the interim they had added lots of more content to the game, which is usually awesome, except that content that they added blocked me from progressing because it was harder than the stuff that was there before. And so on a second playthrough, I couldn't even get to the first last boss because the new stuff they added basically prevented me from doing what I was trying to do. That, that felt incredibly bad. Like this cool new thing that should be fun just made me really upset. That's super frustrating. I and, don't know the history of this. What what was added that Hive Knight you? specifically took yeah. me lots and lots of tries my second play through the game. And like I think I probably could have eventually beat it, but in the process of trying, I lost all my geo and died to be oh, yeah. was really and bad. Just was like screw this. And like I really loved that game. I mean, Ash was noticing a little while back, like, I put a lot of hours into this game without ever having actually beaten it. Yeah. And I would still, like, as frustrated as it made me, I would still highly recommend it to people because it is really good, but just if your reflexes aren't perfect, if you're not used to playing Metroidvanias, like, you might not be able to beat it. I mean, I feel like Twitch reflexes aren't necessarily a Metroidvania thing. No, but just, you know, in this I don't know. This the game thing a lot particular. of Metroidvanias go on, particularly anything after Symphony of the Night, is you can level up and get stronger, and you have healing potions, and you have a whole bunch of ways to basically just go through a fight. Yeah, I mean, like, I I never would have beaten Symphony of the Night had I had to rely on pure skill in the fights. I leveled the shit out of my character. I had, like, the best items available when I first beat it. Grind in the library for a while until you have. A I screen. ground the hell out of the library. But yeah, and Hollow Knight doesn't have that. I mean, you know, you can get some masks and things to have a little more health and stuff. You can upgrade your nail, but but you also you're that. also hard capped on how many of those you can use. Yeah, and I don't know. I don't know how. Uh, I don't know how the Hollow Knight like internet community is, but. Holy wow, is the Hyper Light Drifter online community toxic? Mm, that's not at all helped by the director's own statements. Yeah, well... What do you mean? The, uh, the game did not launch within any difficulty settings, and uh, there were... He said some things. Maybe that's why I had it in my head that it didn't have difficulty settings. The, let's Probably. be completely clear, it's easy difficulty is not easy. Yeah. I don't even know what its difficulty settings change. I think you get more invulnerability when you use healing potions, or you get actual, any invulnerability when you use healing potions. That's it? Something else, but I think that's the major one. Well. But anyway, I'm kind of eager to hear what people have to say about the newer stuff that's been added to Hollow Knight, because like, I'm genuinely curious about it, even if I probably won't get the chance to play it. So I'm, I'm coming at this from a very different angle. <laughs> You've been playing too much Letter B six times. So there was one moment in my entire MMO career where I was the raid leader. And then I was never allowed to be the raid leader again because there's a boss called Soaz. And everyone hated Soaz, but I loved it because it was this fight that I could bash myself against and like see incremental improvements. But like it was really hard and I really wanted to beat it. And that's not a healthy outlook for a raid leader. But when you give me that in a single player game, I I like I just spent, you know, two hours beating my head against Nightmare King Grim. Uh this really cool boss battle that's intentionally supposed to be very, very difficult, and I managed to kill him after like meticulously learning his patterns and slowly getting better and better until I was actually able to like hang with this fight and I felt myself getting better and I I felt this in a way that I don't even feel when I play Dark Souls um and I'm not 100% sure why I think it's the art design actually this game is so good at contrast and showing you where you where you are, where your enemies are, and just letting you know all of the information you need to make decisions. 
Nightmare King Grimm was definitely the hardest boss in the game when he was added. I have not seen any harder bosses, although I know that they exist now. <laughs> I think that's one thing that's really nice about it is, I mean, as frustrating as it is that my skills aren't up to it, it never felt unfair. It just felt too difficult. And there's a difference. Right. Like, it didn't yes. feel random and stupid. It just was too difficult for me to perform the things I needed to do. And I feel like, as a as a slight aside, I feel like that's one of those things... It's one of those reasons why uh, why darks why why you see so much um, comparison to Dark Souls is because in a lot of ways Dark Souls is like that as well. Like yes, there's exceptions, but a lot of these games the it they feel fair. It's not that they're they're not just like it isn't. Oh, here's a hallway where here's like here's a hallway where if you don't know what's going to happen, you're just going to die. I mean, Demon Soul was really, really bad about that. That's why I was specific about my terminology. <laughs> um, and and because Demon Soul, and and in a lot of ways, this is why everybody talks about Dark Souls and not Demon Souls, even though they're the same company and one of them came first. Uh, because Demon Souls did not. Demon Souls took out a lot of glee in randomly killing you and making you rely on uh, like often questionable warnings from other players to to not be to to be warned about what what might be about to happen whereas later games in the series were like no this is this is what you got to deal with just be there or don't um and so i think i feel like that that fairness is really good in a like it's a it's difficulty that feels good when it's tough but fair um and I feel I feel like the next step is as as Grace was talking about. I feel like the next step is okay. And now for when people can't quite get there, they need an out as well. Yeah. See, th- this is this is interesting. I I have never felt that Dark Souls is as fair as some people say it is. Mostly because maybe it's just because it's like I'm looking at 3D models versus 2D models. I can't read the Dark Soul Tells. Oh, yeah. No, I find Dark Soul Tells uh, eminently more readable than 2D Tells. Yeah, I find Hollow Knight's Tells really, really easy for me to read, and I never felt that in Dark Souls, whereas Dark Souls definitely does have, like, if you want, you can just level yourself up. Yeah. And, and then you can become very powerful and be able to just ignore a lot of the really challenging mechanics yeah it was interesting i when you were commenting about how you felt like hollow knight was really good at tells my opinion is entirely the opposite i i find hollow knight frustrating in i frequently find it frustrating in that stuff just happens and i can't tell where what's safe and what's not there's a million things happening on screen and i can barely keep track of where my character is much less whether i'm in a safe place yeah, that's 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 interesting. This is this is just got to be like how we interact with the various spaces in gaming. Because yeah, I've I have never really Dark Souls three is better than Dark Souls one at me being able to read tells, but I I'm still just not great at it. Yeah. Whereas one of the re- one of the things that I really like about um, you know, for example, Elder Scrolls Online is. I can watch in 3D as things have tells that I can follow. Yeah, like Monster Hunter, World Monster Hunter falls World, into the same way. Yeah, Monster Hunter World is exactly the same way, where it's all about watching the monster. I'm not watching particle effects. I'm not watching frames. I'm not watching. I'm watching the thing that's happening in front of me. Like, Hunter if you World. see the shoulder go in this direction, they're about to go do this attack. Yeah. See, that's the stuff that I never understand. It might be, and and it it occurs to me, um, it might be that I spent years training to read those kinds of things, whereas I never never did that in two D. But like I spent well, years. And a lot of, of Mega Man. Yeah, I never an did. awful lot of early MMO encounters, like especially in EverQuest and Dark Age Camelot. The only real tell that you would ever have that a specific attack was coming up was that like some vague assemblage of motions would happen 
yeah they weren't like hey starting to cast this spell um that's interesting well and and what i was thinking of specifically was that i was a martial artist for 10 years ah and absolutely you learn to read people's motions and a game with good tells is really good about making those motions realistic like honestly that's a huge that's a significant like mark for me of does a game have good tells is are they intuitive to you are they intuitive to me but also i never played i never played Mega Man. i never played bullet hell shooters so i'm really bad at reading 2d but yeah this game has a ton of depth a ton of different ways to play i'm still like getting better even as i play as ash often uh comments i need to learn that i have spells i can cast uh i mostly just sit here and wail on things with a nail because because I'm, I'm still, I feel probably mostly influenced by the Rogue Legacy game when I come to these. And I know there was Rogue a... Legacy had some characters with really good spells, too. Yeah, it did. I didn't play them. <clears throat> but it does have a really cool story. And the, like, true ending that you get is super, super cool storytelling that they've got. Apparently yeah, this game is well over a year old, but it is acts like it's much less than that because nobody cared about it apparently until it came up with the Switch. <laughs> so what's the statute of limitations on spoilers in this one? I have no idea. For Hollow Knight? I don't know. I mean, I, I would say we're past it. Mm. Spo- Hollow Knight spoilers coming up, I guess. <laughs> yeah, apparently. The game sort of... I really like the storytelling in Hollow Knight and I have varied opinions about the type of storytelling Hollow Knight uses. See. Hollow Knight tells most of its story via enemy descriptions and vague pieces of NPC dialogue. And reading their minds. And, yeah, occasionally reading the minds of NPCs. I was going to say, speaking of, like, from we were just talking earlier about questionable limitations of this storytelling mechanic, <laughs> Hyper Light Drifter. I mean, yes. Like, some games do it much better. Like, this is how Dark Souls tells most of its story. And Dark Souls is eventually understandable. Hollow Knight is also eventually understandable, but it is definitely possible to miss all of it. Or do you miss miss enough of it that you're just sort of like, I kind of know what's going on, but I don't know any of the details here. Uh, That, I want to raise my hand, that was 100% me, and I was like, there's clearly a story happening here, but I have not seen enough of it, nor do I have any idea how to see enough of it to make any sense of it. And, yeah. There is a bug kingdom, it has fallen. That's what you can find out, like, what you pro- what you probably can't miss. Yep. That's, that's basically the only part you can't miss. There's a bug kingdom, it has fallen. You start in this little tiny village above ground. You might also pick up that there's some sort of infection and or plague. It's orange. I feel like the infection plague is also something you can miss, though. Yep. What? It's a it's... little hard because after you beat your first dreamer, the pro- crossroads becomes infected. Uh, totally missed it. I feel like that's really hard to miss. How did that? How did you miss it, actually? I I don't know how I don't know how I missed it. I played the game and yeah. did not realize that. I mean, you should have gone. You, you I mean, I guess in theory you could just not not have ever gone into the crossroads again after that point. But I mean, nothing else. Like you probably would want to go by the grub hub after rescuing some grubs. <laughs> well, but yeah, like everything in the crossroads, there's like orange growths everywhere, and, and all the monsters get worse. From forgot. From Forgotten Crossroads to Infected Crossroads. That too. <laughs> I don't know that I ever went back to the Crossroads. You have to go back to beat the game. I mean, like, I don't think that I That's went true. there in a way such that I was paying any attention to what was going on. That's fair. Because <laughs> I, it's entire like, given my ability to keep up with the map in that game, I think I thought that was a separate location. Like, that wasn't, <laughs> I didn't think that was the same location but infected, I thought that was a different location with a similar layout, which might be why I never, also never went back to the Grub Hub. P.S. That's my favorite name for that. Yep, that's what I'm calling it from here on, here on in. But the underlying story is that the Pale King, who you can see visions of, can see his maybe corpse, maybe just dream corpse, who knows, that part is not clear, is um, he became ruler of Hollow Nest, and he wanted people to forget about the old ruler of Hollow Nest, the uh, moth known as the Radiance. And so he commanded the Moth Tribe to basically seal the Radiance, and that was that. Except the Radiance came to people in dreams and started infecting them and causing them to go crazy. So he came up with a plan to contain the Radiance. 
in a vessel who was the Hollow Knight, who had no emotions, no mind, and could just be ho completely hollow and contain this thing. And it didn't work. So that's where you are when you start the game. The Pale King is gone. Hollowness has fallen, presumably to the infection. The Hollow and Knight is sealed away. The Hollow Knight is still sealed away, but he is leaking. Yep. And there are three dreamers that like maintain the seal on the Hollow Knight. I didn't so realize... ostensibly, you're supposed to, you know, defeat the dreamers so you can break the seal and therefore replace the Hollow Knight and be a better one. At least that is the first two endings. Because you are an abomination of science. Congratulations. You are a better abomination of science than the original Hollow Knight. So if you do enough other things, you can find out that maybe this isn't the best of ideas and uh, defeat the Radiance once and for all, question mark? Question mark. <laughs> I know the game has new endings, but I am not good enough to see them yet. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because God Home added two? It added two, two, asterisk. I think, yeah. Or I guess God Master is the name of the expansion. God Home is the area. If you can beat a very, very stupid boss rush, you can get a new ending. If you can also deliver a gray flower to the, uh, what is it, the God Seeker, you can make it another new ending. No, look, I don't understand why they have this obsession with the gray flower. Yeah. Because it's a really funny quest. Maybe the first time. <laughs> I'm like, I can answer this. It's a really funny quest. That's a different thing. It's like the, it's everything that's wrong about an escort quest except without an actual escort. Yeah. I guess we can so, take a brief moment to describe this thing. You are given a gray flower that you need to take from literally one side of the huge map to the other side of the huge map. P.S. Hollow Knight has a really, really huge map. Like, as far as Metroidvanias are concerned, Hollow Knight is the biggest one I have ever played. So you take this gray flower. Time lost. You take this gray flower from one side to the other. Okay, no problem. The gray flower breaks if you fast travel, for the most part. You can take the tram. You can't take the stag stations and you can't dream warp. It also breaks if you take damage of any kind. This sounds miserable. Yes. So you have to make it all the way across the map without taking damage or using fast travel. That sounds like misery. I think I've had many very I have to do this in games. The very final room is designed to tilt you because it requires you to make three fairly precise dashes. The first time I did this, I did not know you could pre-clear. Enemies respawn mostly like Dark Souls and that when you sit on a bench, most major enemies respawn. Some minor enemies respawn other than that. Mm -hmm. So if you take the entire path in reverse, you can kill everything that really threatens you. And then delivering the flower is somewhat easier. I still die to stupid jellyfish. I hate those jellyfish. Anyway, back to the plot. So you were saying something? I was going to ask, so what is Hornet? Because I still don't understand that <laughs> one. She's your sister. She's your sister, sort of. Hornet is also an abomination of science, except created with actual emotions. She's maybe the daughter of one of the dreamers i forget if that's like explicitly stated or not if you fight hornet the second time before you beat hair of the beast she is crying after you beat hair of the beast the the white lady explains this somewhat that basically she was part of a deal to get Hera to be one of the dreamers because it's mentioned elsewhere that the bugs of deep nest did not like hollow nest very much as to why she is called hornet i don't know this game has lots of bees, and she is not one of them. She's a cosplayer. <laughs> Just a hobby. There is, it's so easy to miss so much in that game. Yeah. So I'm curious who the person with the Mothwing cloak is. Because it sure looks like you, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean it's other vessels one of the clearly got are. out because you can see them dead in Nost's room, among other things. Mm -hmm. Like you? It's just that you're the one you're... that lived. <laughs> you're the one that you're the one that like got out of the kingdom entirely and then came back, which is apparently pretty rare. Quirrell seems to be the only other person who has done this. Who? Quirrell. Oh right. Yep. Although well, cloth also mentions being from outside the kingdom, but I want to talk things hidden in dumb places. There are secret rooms in the White Palace. What? That, yes. Look. <laughs> so I can't get to those anymore now, can I? You can re-enter the White Palace now. When they added the Path of Pain, they let you re-enter the White Palace. Well, that's nice of them. I don't think I want to re-enter the White Palace. <laughs> this is fair. But, like, you can see a chair that has a very clear imprint of the White Lady. It plays the same music that your shade does. So she was taking care of someone in there. So the White Palace is the creators of Hollow Knight really liked Meat Boy. They liked a lot of things. Yeah. White Palace is Meat Boy. 
Grimm and Nightmare King Grimm are because they really did like classic Castlevania. Yeah. Is that a classic Castlevania fight? No, but he's very close to Dracula. He fights in a sort of similar way. I mean, Nightmare King takes all the limiters off, but the first Grimm fights sort of like Dracula. But it's like over two playthroughs, I basically, it sort of took me to piece together all of the parts of this story. The first playthrough, I looked up, I beat the game, didn't really have any idea what was going on, other than this stops the infection somehow. By the time I got the Sealed Siblings ending, I had some idea of how it was supposed to actually work. And then after running into the Radiance a whole bunch of times, I then got the game's actual ending, sort of. The game does not have any happy endings, just putting that out there. Yes. Yeah, there, there is no, there isn't really a good ending. There's an ending where you beat the Radiance, though. Yeah. I miss happy endings in games. I kind of do, too. I was thinking that with this game. I kind of wish there was a happy ending. I guess things are pretty good for Hornet at the end. Apparently things are even better for Hornet in the new ending, and that's speculation is that that's what the DLC is going to use. I hope the DLC doesn't require you to, like, get that ending. That would be unreasonable. Especially it's since they're going to make you pay for it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to pay for this DLC, but... Uh, I'm not going to if it requires that. Seriously. Also, if I get to play as Hornet, I am super all in. I mean, that's what the new DLC is going to be. They, they it's a Hornet campaign, but we have we know no details about it yet. Like th- this is a thing that we've been expecting since it was a stretch goal on the Kickstarter. But yeah, mostly the the free expansions have been more new, harder bosses and. Then a couple of new endings in Godmaster. Godmaster seems like it's going to have a lot of uh, story, though. Godmaster kind of figures is a character that. who is... I don't even know how to put this properly. The Godseeker seems like a confusing character. And, well, there's only one god left for the Godseeker to find in this, this place. So uh, right. maybe you should work so that it's, you know, not that one? I don't know. I am, at some point, going to start taking shots at the Godmaster boss rush content. If nothing else, just so I can fight Sly. Who's Sly? The Nail Master. Ah. The Shopkeeper. Right. That seems like a funny thing. That's That was one of the things they showed off in promo material, is that they have the... You can fight the Nail Masters, including the one who has decided he's not going to be a Nail Master anymore, but is definitely not any worse with his paintbrush than he was with a nail. So you can fight Mato and Oro, you can fight Shio, you can fight Sly. The other new bosses are a new version of the Hollow Knight, which I have heard nothing but pain about, a new version of the Radiance, which I have also heard nothing but pain about, and some slightly tweaked versions of other bosses. Like, instead of the Mantis Lords, you fight Sisters of Battle. What if, after beating one, you didn't fight two, but instead all three? Ugh. What if Nosk had wings? Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly feel like Winged Nosk is not any harder than not Winged Nosk, but the others, like, Mantis Lords are... I've got, I got pretty good at that fight, because I've started... Got, I've gotten used to doing it without any upgrades, but it gets super fast when you have three things to avoid and not two. Ugh. Yeah. I guess that's a, you know, I don't know. I mean, for people who are super into the game and the difficulty of the game, I guess that's, like, really good content. But I would rather see just more different interesting bosses than, like, hey, here's a boss that you've pretty much already seen, but now we've made it even more stupid. Yeah, that's why I like that they added the Nail Masters. But yes, they also felt the need to add some other stuff. So I've slid several of the topics um, that we were going to talk about (laughs) because the show's gone a little long with this topic, but I think we probably have a very short topic worth to talk about. Um, Diablo 3 Season 15 started. Um, and because Grace and I are, I don't know, gluttons for punishment at this point. Creatures of habit, maybe. Creatures of <laughs> habit, yeah, that's better. Um, <laughs> we're 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 doing that, and like one of the cool things they've done for the last two seasons um, that I think is really cool is they they have created basically a special event rule that's in place during the season. So like last time it was anytime a goblin spawned, two of them spawned. And this time, anytime you do a round of bounties and you get one of the bounty chests, you get two bounty chests instead. Wow. So it is no longer really an issue to get materials for things. <laughs> um, 
So we've been uh, leveraging the fact that there are bounties aplenty and doing mostly those as we level. Yeah, it's. I mean, this one is not as sexy or as silly as double treasure goblins, but I think in the long run it's like pretty profitable. I mean, there's not much new in season, and there hasn't been much new in Diablo since you know the Necromancer pack, but. Um, but for whatever reason, it's still just fun enough, and the the addition of these new rule sets for the seasons, like just enough to make me feel like it's worth it to come back and at least clear the season journey and get the cosmetics. Yeah, and get my free pet. Um, I don't know. Like, I know BlizzCon is coming soon, and as always, I'm hoping to hear stuff from Diablo. As as with every year. I'm hoping to hear stuff about Diablo, and I am stealing myself for massive disappointment. <laughs> but there seems to be a lot of signs that there's at least something coming this year. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be what I want to hear, but it seems like there's going to be at least a couple Diablo-ish announcements. I mean, they've they've done a lot recently to buff the community staff because like, they've hired two additional community managers that are now fairly active on social media and doing regular content um for about the game um so that tells me that something is at least in the works if you're you know awakening a dormant franchise like that um i know in november second or something like that or first part of basically first week in november we're getting Diablo 3 for the Switch. November 2nd. So, I mean, that's something that was announced during the last Nintendo Direct. Um, or, I think, coinciding with the last Nintendo Direct. Additionally, there's some weird rumors about a Diablo um, animated series. And I don't know exactly what that's going to be or if it's really a thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd heard it referenced in uh, towards, like, the... Uh, Castlevania Netflix series sort of thing. Say, is this like Cast- Castlevania did well on Netflix, so we want one of those? <laughs> I don't Sounds know. Like yeah. it, but like Diablo's story is so nonsense. I'm a little <laughs> curious what on earth they would do given but a they, TV show. They made a story based on Castlevania 3, so I think they can mm-hmm. make a story based on Diablo. I mean, Castlevania 2 had a better story than Castlevania 3, and a lot of people just hate Castlevania 2. I'm not one of them, but I love Castlevania too, but yeah. So like, I don't know. It's I I have maybe more hope than I've had in a while that that something's gonna happen. Um, I mean, at least there will be Diablo on the schedule this year, which has been a thing that wasn't true in some previous years. So that's something. I've not seen a floor layout diagram to know if there is space for Diablo or not, because like that's been a thing that's happened recently. Like, I mean. The last time that they had floor space was in relation to the uh, Necromancer pack, and I think they were just kind of crammed into a corner. <laughs> oh. So yeah, it's it's the it's the game that always feels like it's unloved by Blizzard, and I'm really hoping that they show it some love because there is a quiet but dedicated fan base. I mean, Diablo was my first Blizzard game, and it's still probably my favorite Blizzard franchise. So yeah, I'm really hoping that it sees some love this year. I always sort of I it's interesting that they don't seem to have forgotten it, but don't seem to do much with it. I feel like I mean I Diablo mean, characters are popular in things like Hearthstone or not Hearthstone, uh Heroes, Heroes of the Storm. Storm. Yeah. But Diablo doesn't have any loot boxes in it. Yeah, and so that's I think it seems like right now they are trying to keep people like me who love Diablo from just wandering off indefinitely just long enough to figure out how to undo the catastrophic mess they did with the auction house at the start of Diablo 3 and figure out how to actually monetize this franchise. And that scares me. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it scares me too. But on the plus side, like, if they royally screw it up, maybe I'll just play the Torchlight MMO. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that is a thing that that's going to happen. <laughs> that does look I mean, fun. At this point, like, there's really no doubt that we're going to play that when it when 
it's available. Like that's oh, yeah, a thing. Absolutely. But hopefully, like I don't know. I'm hoping that we get some news, and I'm hoping that it's not horrible news because it it feels like they're they're staffing their social media group for a reason. Let's make wild predictions. Let's say Diablo Four is an M- free to play MMO with ridiculous cash shop. That's yeah. I think that's the worst case scenario. <laughs> I I would love to I see. Mean, it doesn't sound terribly unreasonable. No, but that's, that's uh, yeah. yeah. I would love to see like Diablo Four roll out with like the basic classic Diablo classes, like the original Diablo classes, and then no, that's boring. No, I mean but then <laughs> then the DLC mechanism is or their their add on mechanism is you buy additional classes every so often, kind of like they did with the Necromancer. I would I would continue to throw money at them to buy additional classes because the necromancer was fantastic. Sure. My expectation. Man, but you have to get me to play the game first. Yeah, I don't want to. If all you have is it. warrior and mage and what was the other one? Monk. The original no, monk, Diablo. Monk, no. Monk didn't no, that was come the, out. It, monk that was, was the Hellfire expansion. This, it was a yeah. archer. <laughs> the, the unofficial expansion done by Sierra. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And God was the monk broken, like just overpowered. I figure Diablo 4 has every class that's been in Diablo previously, plus another, oh, 50 or so. But you only have access to three initially, and you have to unlock more by collecting sufficient, you know, currency in game. <laughs> or, or, cash. or you can, you know, Make it just illegal pay to unlock them. Yes. And if you pay uh, cash, and if and and you don't unlock a a particular class, you just you know unlock a class, and you get to find out which one you got. Yeah, oh, ran, God. random random class loot box. Yep. No, I, I, uh, no, 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 and cosmetics. Oh, hey, come on, cash. come on. If you have better than that, right? Oh, oh, wait, you just wait. So if they have you remember, good hats, I'll be okay. You remember Mass Effect 3's multiplayer, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So. <laughs> Not just classes, but also gear and consumables come from loot boxes, which you can get slowly through uh, through playing the game or buy on their cash shop. And when you level up classes all the way, there's a mechanic for you to lose that character and re-level a new one for some bonus. But you're just describing Mass Effect 3. Exactly. I mean, you know what Blizzard is really good at? See, I was going to say... <laughs> I was going to say when you when you unlock a random class, you can get a duplicate of a class you already have, which yeah. means you get plus one to a, a stat on that class. Yeah. Yep. You're also still just describing Mass Effect Three. <laughs> Look, we're talking about Blizzard here. <laughs> like. Also, I played Mass Effect Three multiplayer. <laughs> I mean, I did too. It was great. But yes, the the unlock mechanism was dumb. Oh, it was terrible. And the the saddest part is even. If it's the worst possible of anything that we could come up with, I'm still going to play it. Yeah, I'm still going to play it. I mean, I won't lie. I it, it is a loop I enjoy enough that I will play it at least for a bit and unless probably actually, complain about it. Yeah, unless it actually requires me to group with other people to play it all, I will play it. I wish and, that uh, I... I... I want to find some way of playing that game that I enjoy more. I I sh- really should try it on a console. You tried it on the yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's gonna be my suggestion. I think, I think I need to try it on a console, but I feel like, but also like the problem with that is if I play it on a console, I can't play with my friends. Yeah. And so at that point, well, I'm like, well, yes, plus, plus this month, right? Is it? I think so. Wait, it's like, one of the it's one of the giveaways this week month. I want to say it is. Oh, maybe I should. Um, I should go grab that. Do that thing. Because yeah, if it is, and I can try it there and play with friends. Because like, I finally figured out what it was. Like, no, I, it's, it's not yet. It is rumored for October. I've commented before, like that. Uh, my problem with that game is all the clicking, and and like I've had the the response I've I've gotten from people is like, yes, it's a game where you click a lot. I can't do that because it's physically painful. Like, it is physically painful for me to play Diablo, and it wasn't until recently that I realized, like, that was what was going on. Um, I mean, we've got some stupid workarounds around that, but, like, yeah. they're kind of stupid workarounds. I mean, Because I mean, both I Grace and I use, like, a keybind for forward motion. Yeah. 
I absolutely use a keybind for forward motion so I don't have to click to move because clicking to move is somewhat painful. Yeah, no, it's misery. I hate it. Um, but, I, but I wonder how much... I, I don't know if I would love that game more if I played it in some form that didn't hurt to play, but... I mean, I've yeah. played it on console and it feels really good on a console. I'd be really interested it, in finding out. It's a different game on a console, though, because, like, your mob density is significantly lower. I, I think I think I would be fine with that. Because the other... has it as an October game for PS Plus, so I guess hang on for two weeks. The other thing that I... Uh, the other thing that I, I frequently have trouble with in that game is it's a 2d game i lose my where my character is because it's not playing with the camera centered on your character is not the best idea and i lose where my character is all the time yeah i've never had that issue mostly i don't care where my character is i just press buttons and lots of demons die i mean that's the, the thing like diablo is my perfect brainless like relaxation game and i've gotten to the point where i'm actually good at it so i can do stupid things like complete the full season journey all the way up through destroyer or whatever the last level is but like it's just smashing demon in the face and honestly like diablo is more repetition than i don't know like there is a skill aspect if you're playing at that level but there's a lot of it that is gearing up enough and having the the, the, the good spec for clearing this season. Ah, uh, yeah. And it's not so much like you need to be higher skilled. And, and maybe, and, and, and again, I don't really know. Maybe that's the thing that I, because part of what I really liked about Hyperlight Drifter was that I could feel myself getting more skilled and be able to do more things because I was more skilled. And I don't know if that was... I leveled up in Diablo, but I don't know if I got better. I mean, I definitely feel like since the addition of seasons as a thing, I have felt myself progressively get better at the game from like looking at the set dungeons as like, oh god, this is something I'm never going to do. They are so stupid to having cleared every single set dungeon for every single set for every single class in the game. So, but you have to enjoy the core loop to get to that point. And it may just not be a core loop that works for everyone. Yeah. I think it's one of those games where I wish I enjoyed it more than I do. I mean, a lot of the loop is kill stuff to get better loot, to be able to kill bigger stuff, to get better loot, to be able to kill bigger stuff, to get better loot. Yeah. Whereas, like, Loot Treadmill doesn't really do it for me, but getting new abilities that let me do new things absolutely does yeah that hasn't been a thing for uh how many years <laughs> 20 expansion came out in 2014 i mean every periodically they patch the game and will change whether or not something is is suddenly good at that point but so like the specs themselves shift over time but even that hasn't it's been pretty static for a while where I mean, there are slight variations from season to season, but mostly I can look at what armor set a season gives and go, oh, I want to play that or not based on how good right. the, you know, the build for that is. Well, I've played Demon of the last two seasons because I enjoy that style of play when I'm playing Demon Hunter. But I will say, like, after doing a lot of seasonal play, the characters feel way more throwaway than they ever used to. Yeah, that is that is a sort of sad thing. And like, I know that you're supposed to be able to rebirth your character and sort of keep it, but I never do that because I just leave my stable of characters non-seasonal with all their stuff. And then at the end of the season, I go through everything I picked up during the season and compare it to what I already have and pitch things I don't need. I'm getting to the point where I'm going to have to start rebirthing characters every single season because, like, I think this is the last slot I have. Oh, I just delete my all my seasonal characters. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, I, I run them for the season, and then when this is done, I shuffle all their gear because it gets sent to you in the mail anyway. So I just shuffle all their gear to whatever <sighs> class I have yeah. on seasonal. I need to I need to basically do that with all of my crusaders and all of my demon hunters and all of my barbarians and basically <laughs> I basically 
uh, figure out which one's going to be the progenitor of the, that class for me and uh, shuffle the good stuff to that class. I need them to give us a way to get more stash tabs. <laughs> That's what I need. Because I have everyone that I could possibly get, including like unlocking them during the season. And uh, uh, Honestly, the thing that I want more than anything in that avenue is I want them to, one, put all of the things that are crafting materials but are not currently stored in the crafting materials tab like the stupid hellfire amulet things and all that stuff in the crafting tab i mean the hellfire amulet things are in the crafting tab Uh... just the keys that unlock the portals aren't but like i guess that's what i mean that's what i mean is the the keys because i think of those mads and you have to use them yeah like i wish you could there was a there was a, a tab like the crafting materials tab for all of your gems like all a key of ring? a key ring yeah like all of the stuff that you're just holding on to but isn't exciting <laughs> but yeah so anyway we'll we will see um because i i guess what blizzcon's mid november yep so not too much farther away i had uh one of our listeners send me a picture of a cat that it managed to get its way into a water bottle box that said something to the effect of wrap it up. So apparently that's like now meme worthy that I say, let's wrap it up uh, at the very end of the show. every time. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but that's the thing that we're going to do now because we've run probably a little long at this point. I don't remember exactly when we got started. We have definitely run long. We've run a little long. Yep. Anyway, uh, hopefully you enjoyed the show, and we will see you again next week. Good night. Good night. night. See you. Good night.